Steve, are you ready to go? Ready. Calling to order the 2022 spring town meeting on this lovely day. Um, just a little, little homework here. In the booklet, which we're going to rely on more than usual this evening, um, there is a little refresher on page 32 of the town meeting procedural rules for any of you who are new or any need to bone up on that. Okay, so that's, that's there. Uh, we are going to have our town clerk, Betsy Sheeran, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, return of service, April 13th, 2022. I, Kevin, Constable Kevin Lopes, hereby certify that I have posted the annual town meeting warrant and annual town meeting warrant of April 26, 2022 and May 16th on April 13th, 2022. Kevin Lopes, there we go. Um, next is if you'll turn to, I gotta get this right, the last page of your booklet. Um, there is the town of, I gotta get this right here. There is a proclamation from the town of Wakefield, Mayreen Butts. Great, and if I could ask school committee member Stephen Ingalls and HRC chair Benny Wheat to join me. It is too hot up here. Um, the town council and the school committee and HRC signed this proclamation um, in April 12th, 2021. I think it still hit, holds true, and so we are gonna um, read it together as we start our town meeting. Thanks. The town of Wakefield, Massachusetts, a proclamation reaffirming Wakefield's commitment to acceptance and openness among all our citizens, April 12th, 2021. Whereas the town of Wakefield's policies, procedures, and practices are intended to prohibit discrimination based on race, color, national origin, ancestry, sex, disability, age, religion, veteran status, uniformed military service, sexual orientation, genetic information, pregnancy, marital status, gender identity, or any other class classification protected by law, and whereas it is also the policy of the Wakefield Public Schools to prevent harassment and discrimination based upon race, color, sex, age, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, national origin, limited English proficiency, disability, or housing status, and... Whereas Wakefield has experienced multiple instances of hate speech and vandalism in recent years, including the recent display of a White Lives Matter banner, by members of a nationally recognized hate organization, and whereas these incidents have occurred against a backdrop of increasing violence against communities of color across the United States, including the recent racially motivated shootings targeted at Asian American women in the Atlanta area, and whereas the number of hate crimes reported in the United States in 2019 reached its highest level in more than a decade, and the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention have identified racism as a serious public health threat that directly affects the well-being of millions of Americans, and whereas the Wakefield School Committee, Wakefield Town Council, and Wakefield Human Rights Commission unanimously approved a resolution, a resolution dated December 4, 2018, condemning racism, racially motivated violence, anti-Semitism, and all forms of hate speech. Therefore, be it resolved that the town of Wakefield, through the elected members of its town council, reaffirm its 2018 proclamation declaring that hate has no home in Wakefield. The town council further condemns all incidents of hate speech and racially motivated violence, both in Wakefield and across the country, and declares its intention to adopt policies and practices that reaffirm Wakefield's place as a welcoming community that value diversity and inclusion. Be it further resolved, as duly voted by the town council, that this resolution be shared with school and municipal leaders in Wakefield and across our region to strengthen our collective fight against racism, hatred, institutional bias, anti-Semitism, and all forms of uh, discrimination. Signed on behalf of town council by its chair in 2021, Ann McGonigal Santos. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
I think Mr. Sherman is up next. Dan. Good to see you, Bill. How are you, Dan? Good evening. My name's Dan Sherman, and I'm a member of the Finance Committee, and I'm going to give you an overview of where we stand uh, before we start voting on our various budgets. So the next slide. Or is that my control? This guy. Yeah. Ha. Works. So in terms of our receipts in the past, um, what's really important out of this slide is the percentage of, of our receipts that come from um, the tax levy, your property taxes at work, and it be it's become a higher and higher proportion of our total budget. And what, what this has helped us with, especially in years when the state decided to cut our aid, um, it's helped us weather those kind of cuts. So some communities, for example, like the, the Worcesters or the Bedfords, um, who uh, rely on a lot of state aid, when the state cuts aid, uh, it's really, really harmful to them. But for us, um, a cut in state aid um, does not harm us as much. We used to be 20% of our revenue um, was state aid, and that was in 2002. It's down now to just a little bit over 10%. Obviously, we'd like to have more state aid. We could do more with it. but. Uh, the reliance on state aid um, is a double-edged sword. Um, you'll also notice that local receipts and others have been very steady. Um, we've, we've done well on uh, tax levy has picked up where the state aid has dropped. And this slide shows uh, what state aid was back in 2001, 2002 at uh, roughly $11 million. And we just now have gotten above that to 2022 and 2023 where above where we were 20 years ago. And you think about that in absolute dollars, we've just reached where we were in 2002. Um, in uh, inflation adjusted our uh, dollars, we got a long ways to go. But it is on the upswing and we do continue to see uh, further upswing and we'll see it in 23 as well as in 22. We have reserves and we've got a good set of reserves. We've uh, actually moved those up in the last few years. Um, this is a stabilization fund. This is our rainy day fund that we can use with a two-thirds vote of town meeting. And you'll see that we had a large balance back around 2000, but then because of the cuts of state aid and other projects, we actually uh, started eating into that stabilization fund, and now we're starting to build it back up again. Uh, the balance is roughly uh, just over $3 million, and it represents about 3% of our total budget. So re remember that 3%. The other reserve we have is our free cash. This is basically the town's checking account. Um, at town meeting, we can vote to spend money out of this account. Um, just takes a majority to do those votes. And you can see our free cash was really suffering for a long time until roughly 2010, 2011, when we finally get our financial house uh, in much better or, uh, order. And now it's sitting up there roughly at 8% of the budget, $8 million, and that 8% plus the 3% from stabilization gives us about 11% for our reserves and the policy adopted by the town uh, council um, and the finance committee and Mr. Mayo is we want to be around 10% as a good reserve uh, against some um, bad times. So financially, we're in good shape going into 23. So for fiscal year 23, um, what the Finance Committee, uh, Mr. Mayo, and the Town Council have uh, decided is that we've got some various budget priorities that we really want to focus on and make sure we maintain uh, proper funding. Um, you can see the list, buildings, education, energy efficiency, which is something we're going to be spending more money on um, trying to become more en energy efficient. Fields and playgrounds, we've made some good head starts in there. We've got some good fields and we're continuing to work on those. Public health, which was a, a really big nut in the last couple of years, and you'll see in tonight's uh, budget a significant increase in the health department, in, both in people and uh, spend. Uh, infrastructure, um, obviously we gotta deal with roads, buildings, and so forth. And finally, public safety is always in there. These are only in alphabetic order. They are not in order of priority. So anybody's trying to reading more into this list than is there, it's just alphabetic. I'm not picking sides. So also for fiscal year 23, uh, as I mentioned, our, our reserves at 10% of the total budget, which is a great spot to be in. Um, we have in, enhanced some services because of COVID. You know, I think you're all aware of that. 
Um, we also have identified this year that we have roughly $93 million in capital projects that are out there over the next uh, five to two, roughly five years. Things we need to look at, um, need to spend some money on. Um, a lot of those will be bonded, so it'll be spread out over time. It's not like we need $93 million you know, in the next five years, but they'll be amortized over, say, a 20 or 15 year period. So we've got some real issues there. Our hotel and meals tax, um, normally we get about a million dollars a year, but because of COVID, we got hammered pretty, pretty hard on that. Uh, we're up around 650 now and expect it to continue to increase as the economy and everything picks up and we hopefully we get past the, the pandemic. Uh, good news side, we had uh, no snow and ice uh, overdrafts, if you will, where we had to um, tap into uh, an excess, so no overdrafts for that. And then we are gonna be spending a lot of money on, on COVID issues, uh, COVID related issues. Our outstanding debt, we do have a debt. We have a lot of debt. Um, we have about $77 million yes to, yet to spend on the various projects, including this auditorium, um, Greenwood Groove, uh, Roof uh, Recreation. We got the roads bonds that's out there. We are spending a lot of money on drainage. Um, so all these outstanding debts are all bonded and we got uh, roughly at $77 million that's outstanding. Our retirement fund, um, we're doing really well. We had a great couple of years on the investments and my best guess, and this is my best guess, is the liability is about, down to about $53 million. Not too long ago, it was over 80 million. So we've, we made some great progress um, in that. And the OPEB unfunded liability, OPEB is other post-employment benefits. This is basically retiree health care. Um, our retirees uh, receive a health care supplement from the town. And um, that um, unfunded liability has dropped significantly. It was well over 90 million just a few years ago. And we're down about 66 million. So all in, we've got roughly $196 million of um, liabilities that we have to deal with over the next uh, 15 to 20 years. Our revenues, what do we expect to receive in revenue? So at the tax levy, we're gonna get a big boost of roughly $5 million, 6.2%. Uh, and it's pretty obvious you look around. We've got all these new buildings. Um, Victor's done a great job and get, get every dollar we can out of this, all these new projects. Um, we've, got, we've got the, um, the uh, new, new power line going in. Um, that'll pick up about a million and a half. So uh, we're picking up uh, quite a bit of revenue on the tax levy side. State aid, um, the state's granted at this point, we think 1.2 million subject to change. There's rumors that could go higher. Uh, we'll see, but we're counting on 1.2 uh, right now as our best guess. Local receipts are on the upswing. We figured that's gonna be around about 8.4 million. Most of that is with um, vehicle excise taxes. So keep buying those new cars. Uh, we're gonna use some free cash if we have to. Um, we get uh, almost a million dollars from light department uh, for various um, uses, um, power lines and so forth. We do pick up about $273,000 from available funds. We have a perpetual care fund, the library's got a trust fund. There's various sources of revenue, um, $273,000 for that. So our total revenues we expect to be about $108 million. Expenditures. So for fiscal year 22, our current year, we're about $102 million. And our proposal for this year as we go through the budgets is gonna be about 108.2. An increase of $6.4 million, roughly 6.3%. Um, the difference, my calculations, I come up with a difference of about $177,000, which is probably the lowest tap of free cash uh, I think we've ever had since I've been on finance committee. If that comes through, uh, we'll be in really good shape. So we've got a, a basically a balanced budget. Um, I think the budget makes a lot of sense. So we still have challenges. We still have challenges with COVID-19. We're still working on those buildings, um, field maintenance. Uh, the fields need a lot of work. Uh, we're working on the sidewalks and roads. We did the road bond. Um, so there's uh, road improvements. And I think we've all seen some of that happening. It'll continue to happen all summer uh, as we work through that. Stormwater, the public safety building, of course, that's um, now in, in process. The high school. Uh, Obviously, everybody knows we got to deal with the high school. That's going to be a, a big challenge for us. And as I mentioned before, we have $93 million in identified projects. 
And that 93 million does not include the high school. Um, that's gonna be another big nut. Opportunities, uh, Eversource power line, that, that's added um, you know, a million five to our revenue. Um, the ARPA, um, American Rescue Plan Act, um, we're gonna have a number of uh, significant funds, I think six million dollars is available if we know how to spend it from ARPA, something like that. Uh, is it eight? Okay, eight, thank you. That's, I was gonna say eight, no, it's six, no, it's eight. Uh, potential increase in state aid, we've talked about that, and we're putting a big effort in grants. There's a lot of grant money out there, so uh, the grant writer is gonna be very busy um, in the coming years. COVID-19, um, a couple of thoughts. If for those of you recall two years ago when uh, we had the town meeting and COVID was at its height, we were extremely, I was extremely pessimistic, more pessimistic than I've ever been regarding local receipts, state aid. Um, we, we cut back on capital, if you remember, from two million down to a million. Um, it was, it looked, looked, looked dire. Well, it turns out it wasn't uh, financially as dire as, as we expected. So we got um, more state aid than we expected. Lo local receipts were better than expected. Um, and we're getting aid from the state and the feds to cover the additional costs for COVID. So we feel pretty good about that. And last but not least, um, the forecast. So this is my best guess as to what's gonna happen in the future. We're gonna have roughly, let's, let's call it two, $200,000 shortfall on, on free, that will tap free cash. Um, and, and what I've done is I put in forecasts for expenditures and income based on you know, my guess as to what's going to happen. Well, inflation has really kicked in, and I have a feeling that my expenditures column is going to be, uh, right now, is a little too short. I suspect if inflation isn't tamed, that we're going to be seeing um, higher values um, in that column, uh, wait and see. But uh, that's one of my fears, is that we'll be spending quite a bit more than would be um, expected in, in that particular column. Uh, the income is just based on additional uh, projects that are coming through. Um, our new growth will continue uh, roughly a million, million and a half per year. We get to two and a half under Prop two and a half plus that. So um, right now we're showing a surplus in years following uh, 2023. Um, I hope it's true, I hope it comes through, but um, that is my best guess. And with that, Mr. Moderator, that is our current financial picture. Okay, as, as always, thank you, Dan. Okay, now what we're gonna do next, we've done in the past, but we're a little more organized because Mr. Mayo and Mr. Mullen are having town meeting envy. They go to other town meetings and they want to be like them. So we're going to be cool. And we're going to do a more expanded and sort of understandable, if that's a word, uh, consent agenda. We've done it before. What it is is this, simply. If you turn to page 30, what these are are articles that come up every year and nobody has anything to say about them. So we spend 20 minutes reading it, doing it, going over, OK? So if you look on page 20, what we would like to do is this. Take, um, we need a motion, Tommy, to take out of order first, right? Okay, but let's, let's explain this. Articles three, four, five, six, and seven, they're all, we do them every year, okay? They're all explained here. You know, one is taking eminent domain to make road repairs. One is moving money that we'd move anyway from municipal gas and light over. So if you take a minute and read those, okay? Look them over, okay? One of them, the eminent domain motion, requires a two-thirds vote. So in order for this to be done, it will have to be unanimous. Uh, that eminent domain is to take, correct me if I'm wrong, Joe, but uh, to take, you know, a strip of roadway to put a curb in or that kind of thing, right? It's very temporary. It happens anyway, and I don't think there's any controversy. So if you'd look those over, and if anyone has any objection to any of those articles being done, or being processed, if you will, under this consent agenda, you want to go to the microphone and raise your objection, okay? Uh, Bob McLaughlin, 376 Water Street. I just had a, I was just gonna ask a question if this was gonna be on Article 5. 
Um, maybe I'm being a little nosy, but I'm just wondering what the 82.5 is, is for the expert witness for the legal action regarding Walton School Edition. Well, uh, Can I ask that question? Uh, it takes it out of the consent agenda then. Correct, Tom? I mean... Yeah, what's, yeah do, do, can you tell them what's the answer? I can, I can answer that. There was an issue with the contractor and that uh, we had to hire an expert to come and look through all of that. And I think we ended up actually saving a lot of money. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. Okay, so we're good. Okay, thank we're you. We're good, yeah, thank you. Dan. <laughs> why, why, thank you, Bill. So Dan Lieber, 1 Elm Street. Just real quick, prior to this vote, do we need to do an acceptance of visitors? Since we Pardon me? An acceptance of visitors. We have people from out of town that have not been accepted into the room. They're okay unless, they're, unless they have to speak. Pardon? Okay. Yeah, they're all signed in unless they want to get up and speak and then there'll be a motion to allow them to speak. They're all okay. signed in, so they're fine. Thank o you. Otherwise, they had the same, same question was already answered. Well, there you go. Okay. Um, so, first I'll entertain a motion to um, take these articles out of order in order to have them processed, if you will, under a consent agreement. Is there a motion? Yes. Uh, Mr. Moderator, that the town vote to take the following articles out of order and as part of a consent agenda. Articles 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. The effective motions of each individual article will be as stated in the recommendation book. Is there a second? Is there any discussion? There being no discussion. This will require a unanimous vote. Um, two thirds. Two thir oh, two thirds, correct. All in favor? I'm sorry. Yeah. All opposed. Is anybody opposed that I can't see? Motion carries. Wow, you guys must be happy, huh? You can tell your friends in other towns. All right, where are we next? Article one. Uh, no, actually, Mr. Moderator, we need to make the actual consent agenda vote now. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna wrap. I was gonna wrap it all in one. Thanks. Yeah. I was so I was so happy on your behalf, so you guys can be cool. Um, all in favor of the motion to um, accept. Yeah, Steve. That, that the town vote to approve the following articles as part of a consent agenda, articles three, four, five, six, and seven, the effective motions of each individual article will be as stated in the recommendation book. Is there a second? Any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay. All right, now we're on to article one. Article one, the budget. Mr. Mayo. That the town vote to raise and appropriate from tax levy or transfer from available funds the sums of money as detailed in the following recommendations for the fiscal year July 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2023. The grand total amounting to $114,171,027. The motions will provide for the breakdown of this amount and the sources thereof in the various classifications as described in the recommendation, recommendation book to carry out the purpose of this article. Is there a second? Should we do each one individually, correct? Mr. Correct. Ma okay. General <coughs> government, Mr. Mayo. Okay. Um, I have a few pithy remarks beforehand, Mr. Moderator. Oh. <laughs> and is there a song? No. <laughs> there is no need to remind anyone in this audience or beyond the last, in this audience or beyond, that the last two years have provided and continue to provide numerous hurdles as we strive to deliver essential services to the public, or in fact, how we as everyday citizens maneuver our daily lives. But thank God we are all still here. And not to minimize some of the horrible losses, personal, social, and financial suffered by many over the past two years, I think it important that we do take a moment and reflect upon how this pandemic has really made all of us part of history. Recall the images and terms that will forever be embedded in our psyche. Who knew what Zoom was a few years ago? Who thought that encouraging in some cans, in, who thought that encouraging or in some cans directing one-way pedestrian traffic around the lake would be under serious consideration? Who thought that a familiar home picture would be face masks drying on the racks or on the doorknobs? We thought our economy and our schools would be closed for only a few weeks, but they were for months. But somehow we made it through, and we made it through together. I mean all of us, from the brave children who got on the bus, masked but ready to learn, to our first responders and essential workers who showed up every day, to those who couldn't enter common areas relying on the help of family and community. We all have a story to tell and the memories are all etched in our brains. 
And I know that many, many of you, at least I hope so, at least the moderator did, enjoy the historical or pop cultural or music references that I present at town meeting. So despite my lack of an Ivy League education, a flaw which has been highlighted by former town councilor McGonagall Santos and town council Mullen, I do complete the reading and I can adapt. So as we transi transition from the pandemic to an endemic, and these are my comments, not any expert, I'm not an expert. Um, so as we transition from the pandemic to an endemic and learn to live with the ups and downs that follow, I offer you my personal sentiments in a rather strained paraphrasing of Shakespeare's St. Crispin's Day speech, which Councilor McGonagall Santo so eloquently quoted at town council meeting on April 25th. So from this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we very happy few, we citizens of Wakefield who battled this condition have won. For whoever sheds blood with us together as we manage this pandemic shall be my brother or sister. So I thank all of our wonderful volunteers, elected and appointed members of town committees, our steadfast town, town employees, especially our first responders, who every day put their lives in potential danger to keep us all safe. And last but not least, our brother and sister citizens, whose support is so important and appreciated. And on behalf of the town and the staff and the town council, I thank you all. As Finance Committee member extraordinaire Dan Sherman presented, we move forward to fiscal year 23, not only stronger, but with a cautious optimism and safe in the knowledge that the last two years were not as bleak as we feared. We look forward to prudently appropriating federal funds to smooth out the dips and valleys as we jumpstart important infrastructure projects that will stand for decades. We've increased capital to 2.1 million in this budget and look forward to building that amount by 5% per year over the foreseeable future. We are funding some important positions on both the school and town side with federal funds and will ease those positions back into our tax levy. This budget includes increased hours for our public health nurse as well as an increased commitment to the state of mental health of our community. We look forward to upgrading our roads, buildings and services as well as exploring all options to help our business community rebound from the pandemic. We continue to fund our retirement and OPED obligations and carefully utilize our debt service fund to improve our infrastructure. More importantly, we continue to attempt the best balance, but continue to attempt to achieve the best balance between the utilization of tax revenue and the retention of prudent levels of reserves possible while answering the well-deserved needs of the community. Together, we have a lot of work to do. Again, I thank my department heads, particularly Kevin Gill, our town accountant, John McCarthy, our treasurer, Victor Santanello, our director of assessments, who a lot of pressure was put on tonight by Dan Sherman. In, ta in tax collections, and my administrative assistant, Sherry Dalton, the Finance Committee, and especially the Town Council for all their hard work, support, and dedication. So with that being said, Mr. Martyr, I will move on to the general government portion of the budget. That the town raise and appropriate the sum of $2,680,088 for general government, and to provide, therefore, that the sum of $4,500 be appropriated by transfer from the Wetlands Protection Act filing fees account to the Conservation Commission Personal Services account and the sum of $2,676,388 be raised and appropriated from tax levy as stated in the recommendation book. Sir, second. second. Mr. Mayo. The general government portion of the town budget provides for the majority of the administrative departments of the town. The total amount recommended for general government is $2,680,888. Although happy to answer any questions, the only real areas of substance changes are an election expense, and that's an increase of 26,000, as there was only one election scheduled for fiscal year 22 versus three in fiscal year 23, an increase in contractual services to the assessing department, as the Department of Revenue now requires annual appraisals of utility companies, utility companies as well as an increase in contractual services in IT for increasing software maintenance costs. The rest of the um, additions in these accounts are contractual and negotiated. This budget includes the town council, accounting, treasurers, IT, legal, tax collectors, assessors, town clerks, election and election registration, conservation, finance committee, planning board, and the board of appeals. And uh, as I said, all are essentially level funded with the exception of contractual and negotiating items or those other items I just mentioned. The recommendation for the general government portion of Article 1 is $2,680,888, dollars 
with 4,500 from available funds and $2,676,380 from the tax levy as stated in the recommendation book. Mr. Sullivan, FinCom. Thank you. The FinCom uh, puts together subcommittees. We review all of the budgets during the budget cycle process. And for these uh, budgets just mentioned, we recommend favorable action. Any discussion on the motion under general government? There being no discussion, the motion is that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $2,680,088, 4500 to be appropriated by transfer, and another sum of $2,676,388 2 from appropriation. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Protection of persons and properties, Mr. Mayo. That the town raise and appropriate from tax levy the sum of $13,698,536 for protection of persons and property as stated in the recommendation book. Is there a second? Mr. Mayo. Thank you. The protection of persons and property section of the budget for 2023 has been set at $13,698,536. The police budget is, a uh, police portion of that is $6,723, excuse me, $6,723,493. This budget provides for police force of 47 police officers, including dedicated school resource officers at the Wakefield Memorial High School, Galvin and the Vocational School, as well as mission-specific positions which focus on domestic violence, mental health, substance abuse, as well as family-related issues. This budget also includes correcting a chronic deficit in the holiday pay line, as well as adding holiday pay for, the, for Juneteenth, June 19th, and the cost for the return of the July 4th parade and activities. And I'm sure we're all very happy to see that back in the budget for this fiscal year. Also included is $50,000 for data store, storage of body camera data information. We also funded the additional hours for the mental health clinician from tax levy not the COVID funds under the CARES Act. So like I said, we're trying to slide some of this into our tax levy budget for things we feel should be continued. Our police department is recognized by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts as a certified police department. Only 23 or so departments in the state are so distinguished. I believe that, I believe that not only is the certification a testament to the high quality and ideals proffered by the chief and his entire core of offices, but has also been helpful in obtaining grants as well as adopting best practices for the day-to-day -day operations designed to better serve the public while reducing the risks of lawsuits. It seems that almost daily I receive letters or calls about how professional and caring our police department is at all levels. We owe a great debt of gra gratitude to the police chief and his entire staff, particularly during these difficult times. The fire department is set at $6,327,332. The increases are in contractual and negotiated areas. I am happy to say that this budget continues to include the deputy chief and fire prevention officer positions, maintains the Greenwood Fire Station, as well as our continued adoption of best practices by ensuring that an officer is manning every piece of equipment. I, for one, am very grateful, as is the whole community, for all the hard work done by our fire department. They keep us safe. Emergency management is slightly increased as Tom Walsh's part-time is more full-time-ish than part-time, and it's still the best uh, val dollar value around. Tom Walsh is our emergency management director. The fire alarm, police signals, and traffic lights portion of this budget is increased slightly to cover the co rising cost of parts in a few more hours. As you know, we see more uh, traffic lights and things like that around town. The inspectional services budget is increased by $54,749 due to contractual and negotiated increases as well as an additional clerical position. It is no secret that this department is very busy with not only multiple major projects under construction in town, but also many daily requests for information, zoning interpretations, zoning enforcement, and property histories. I, for one, am very impressed with how the building department manages all these tasks along with monitoring all of the new construction. Finally, this department continues to be a great revenue source, generating approximately $600,000 a year in fees to date this fiscal year. I think we'll probably uh, approach seven or $800,000 this year in fees. The animal spectrum and parking clerks budgets are level funded. The entire amount requested for protections of persons and property is $13,698,536. Mr. Sullivan. 
Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion under the protection of persons and property section of the budget? There being no discussion, the motion before you is that the town raise and appropriate from the tax levy, levy the sum of $13,698,536. All in favor? All opposed? The motion carries. Human Services, Mr. Mayo. That the town raise and appropriate from tax levy the sum of $1,000,000. $3,195 for human services as stated in the recommendation book. Is there a second? Mr. Mayo. The request for the human services portion of Article 1 is $1,003,195. This the requested budget for the Council on Aging portion of this is $247,300, an actual reduction of $13,000 due to retirement and restructuring of the office staff. I also have to say that we goodbye to our longtime and wonderful director. Judy Luciano, who has sadly retired. Is Judy here tonight, by the way? See, she got away already. I don't blame her. Yes, I know that. She will be so sorely missed, but we look forward to our new director, Karen Burke, who is no stranger to us, as she was our district v veteran services coordinator. We expect great things out of Karen, and Karen has this roll up the sleeves attitude uh, that Judy had, and she's going to do great things with the department. Karen, thank you very much. Happy to see you here today. Um, we all know what the Council of Aging does, and despite the pandemic, they continue to provide services to the approximately 5,000 citizens of Wakefield, 60 years of age and older, and actually went out to them because, you know, they couldn't come and gather for so long. Uh, went out to them or set up um, tax information, uh, ice cream socials outside. I was happy to go to a few of them with Victor. Really great, and they just do a marvelous job for us. The Health and Human Services budget is recommended at $383,076. It is certainly clear that from the federal level to the local level, increasing services to better the mental health and well-being of all is paramount. This budget increase represents a full-time sanitarian, increase from part-time last year, as it is clear a half-time position could not provide the necessary inspections and follow-ups according to best practices in the industry, a half-time public health nurse to not only assist in the ongoing COVID issues, but there's a lot of other things going on too, and, and assistance needs to be provided to the public there. And as importantly, the department will be staffed with an assistant director as well as a social services coordinator. These new positions will better coordinate mental health assistance with the cl clinicians at the police department, as well as assist our citizens connecting with vital social services. Our goal is to provide these services early on in order to reduce the, reduce the need for more drastic and costly intervention later. We only need to listen to the nightly news, both locally and nationally, to see how society at every, every level is beset with many mental health needs, needs that were only exacerbated by the pandemic. I am most proud that Wakefield has and will continue to be the gold standard in this regard. We will fund these increase, increases through a combination of tax levy and ARPA funds as we transition to fully funded through the, next, through the tax levy in the coming years. The recreation portion of this budget is increased by $3,000. Dan McGrath and his staff continue to provide great programs from the community, young and old, and I expect another explosion in activities this summer. So sign up as soon as programs become available. You don't want to be left out. The veterans budget is increased by $3,600. The veterans benefit, for benefit department administers payments to the recipients of hospital and medical benefits, as well as ordinary subsistence benefits. The town has reimbursed up to 75% of these costs by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. A special thanks goes to our Veterans Advisory Board. This board continue to, to, continues to assist in the outreach effort to provide the best possible services for our veterans. The total recommendation for Human Services section of Article 1 is $1,003,195, all from tax levy. Mr. Sullivan. And the Finance Committee does recommend favorable action. Any discussion on the motion under the Human Services portion of the budget? There being no discussion, the motion before you is that the town raise and appropriate from the tax levy the sum of $1,003,195. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Mayo, we are on Public Works Department. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. That the town raise and appropriate the sum of 
$584,130 of public works and to provide, therefore, that the sum of $91,722 be appropriated by transfer to the public works personal services account from the following accounts. Perpetual care income, $43,721. Park trust funds available, $1. Sale of lots funds, $48,000 and the sum of $7,492,408 be raised and appropriated from tax levy as stated in the recommendation book. Is there a second? Mr. Thank Mayo. You. The request for the public works budget is $7,584,130, an increase of $227,795, or 3%. The bulk of the increases are due to contractual obligations which I am pleased to say includes a new three-year contract with the Laborers' Union through June 30th, 2025. So all townside contracts are settled through the next fiscal year, which is great. The staffing level for the public works will be, will be 79, including water and sewer, in fiscal year 2023. However, staffing levels are still short of the 84 employed in the 1990s. The public Works Department has done an excellent job in preparing their budget and maintaining the town's infrastructure under difficult fiscal constraints. The funding added to this budget is, is greatly needed and will go to a long way in improving a great community. But this is a no-frills no budget. It is a budget that provides efficient, effective, and economical services to the community. The DPW's professional approach and dedication has been key to maintaining the core services that they provide. The recommendation for this portion of the budget is that $7,584,130 be appropriated with $7,492,408 from tax levy and $91,702 from available funds. Mr. Sullivan. <coughs> and the Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion on the motion under the public's work portion of the budget? There being no discussion, the motion is that the, that the town raise and appropriate for the sum of $7,584,130 um, with the transfers and appropriations as set forth in Mr. Mayo's previous motion. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Public Works Enterprise Departments, Mr. Mayo. That the town raise and appropriate the sum of $15,353,193 the Public Works Enterprise Departments and to provide therefore that the sum of $6,204,494 be appropriated by transfer from water receipts to the various water division budget accounts listed in the recommendation book and the sum of $9,148,699 be appropriated by transfer from sewer receipts to the various sewer division budget accounts as listed in the recommendation book. Is there a second? Mr. Mayo. Thank you. The water and sewer divisions are self-sustaining departments and are not part of the tax levy. These two budgets are well structured and ensure that we continue to maintain and improve our water sewer infrastructure and provide safe drinking water to the community. The water budget has actually decreased um, by 73,000 or 1 percent. And, uh, but it is important to note that the MWRA water assessment, um, we're not going to get those final rates for a while yet, but we think we have a pretty good idea. Um, so we're doing very well there, although the water, um, the water represents 42 percent of that budget, the MWRE charge. The sewer budget has increased $166,566, or 1.8 percent, and that is because the sewer assessment increase was about $106,000. So um, it's important to note that these are self-sustaining budgets that do not come from the tax levy, and I am also happy to report that these budgets are also, these budgets also include the newly agreed contract with the laborers union um, who staff these divisions. So the recommendation for this portion of the budget is that $15,353,193 be appropriated from the respective enterprise divisions, which is really a modest increase of 0.6% over last year. Mr. Sullivan. The Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion under the motion for the Public Works Enterprise Departments of the Budget? There being no discussion, the motion is that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $15,353,193 for Public Works Enterprise Departments and to provide 
as set forth by Mr. Mayo in his motion. All in favor? All opposed? The school department. Is it officially Dr. Lyons? Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. Almost kind of close, Dr. Lyons. <laughs> Good luck. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. The motion that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $47,722,077 for the school department and to provide therefore that the sum of $115,000 be appropriated by the transfer to the school department contractual services bus transportation allocation from the offset receipts of 2023 bus transportation user fees and that the sum of $47,607,077 be raised and appropriated from the tax levy. The total recommendation for the school department is $47,722,077. Is there a second? second? Dr. Lyons. Thank you, Mr. Mayo, Mr. Moderator. Um, for, the, for the speakers that spoke ahead of me, their words are our words. We have not worked more closely than we have over the last few years. It's terrific to be back in person here with town meeting members and students that are also in attendance. Thank you for coming tonight, much appreciated. As we continue the recovery phase of living with and managing COVID, Faculty, staff, students, and family, families appear to be doing well managing the ongoing effects of the virus. We have been able to keep schools open and extracurricular activities going, which we are pleased to report. We would not be able to have done all of this work without the help of many. That includes students, families, and especially our local Board of Health and our nurses. In the proposed budget, we are prioritizing direct service to students, intervention services, increased counseling and special education support. This budget also better supports elementary science opportunities and opportunities for students to receive academic support through Wakefield Academy and Acceleration Academy. Included in this budget are resources for facilities that include a focus on HVAC and air facilitation and air quality we are also planning our, not only this budget, but future budgets with an eye on, as Dan pointed to and alluded to earlier, kind of an eye on the economy and an eye on inflation. As we watch the news day after day, we look at the supply chain challenges that we are all facing, as well as the human resource challenges that affect all districts. We are trying to be thoughtful on how to stretch resources and how to plan thoughtfully but we are also looking at how to best support our most vulnerable employees. The School Business Administrator, Christine Bufagna, and Assistant Superintendent, Kara Morrow, have been exceedingly effective applying for and managing our state grants, as well as direct services for students. We have worked collaboratively with the Permanent Building Committee, the Project Management Group Left Field, the design team from SMMA, as, as well as others to present the information that, has, that we have worked to create that we will be presenting on July 1st to the MSBA as part of Module 3 as we move on to the next phase of design of the new Wakefield Memorial High School. To date, we have met all milestones and we'll be presenting additional information in the fall. The proposed budget supports 594 employees in seven bargaining, in, excuse me, in seven bargaining units. I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to thank our nurses, our teachers, our paraeducators, our custodians, our food service personnel, and our clerical unit, as well as our crossing guards. This also would not be possible without the direct support that we all receive from our district administrators and our building principals. We would like to thank students and families for their ongoing support. I would also like to thank school committee, town council, Mr. Mayo, as well as FENCOM. Thank you very much. Hello.
So the Finance Committee does recommend favorable action. You will note in the book there is a typo. Uh, our number should have a dollar sign in front of it, and it's the same number as the Town Council's request. Thank you. Any discussion on the motion? Mr. McLaughlin. Dr. Lyons, I wouldn't go anywhere. There's questions. You're not getting off that easy. Bob. Yeah, Bob McLaughlin, 376 Water Street. Uh, Dr. Lyons, I have a, uh, one uh, question for you. Um, with all the construction going on in town with the uh, condos and the apartments and the 40Bs, um, are we prepared to handle the influx of students going into the current school system? Are we, are we all set for buildings for the, next, for, for the foreseeable future? Uh, I guess my biggest question, are we maxed out in schools right now? As we, as we sit right, right here right now? We're, we're pretty close. I think the new high school is definitely going to help us with that. You know, one of the things that the design team allows for is, is growth in that area. So th there will be some space in the new building that will allow for, for growth. But as part of the process, the engineering team has done an enrollment study, a projection for the next 10 years, and they're predicting a, a stable um, kind of look at, at kind of how we're projecting out in those 10 years. Um, I'm not convinced of that with the, all of the building that's happening. I'm but, not either. But I am feeling pretty confident that the high school will allow us the space to grow if we need to grow. Um, I'm more concerned about the elementary schools right now because young families are going to be moving into these, some of these apartments. There's mm -hmm. no doubt in my mind about it. Yep. And I'm really concerned about, you know, for, for instance, the Dole Bear School that is going to be, you know, if it's already maxed out. Um, do you uh, foresee, uh, and it's happened over decades, uh, you know, putting in temporary classrooms to get that, you know, just to get over the peak? So, you know, we'll do whatever's necessary. I know that uh, Mr. Mayo has been very thoughtful at kind of holding on to some spaces that we might be able to expand into if we needed to. I don't want to speak for Mr. Mayo, certainly, um, but I do think we do all have an eye on the future, and we, we're looking ahead to, to kind of trying to understand exactly what the new construction will bring. Yeah, I would suggest uh, the town entering into some sort of a study, a real, real hard study, because uh, when all this stuff comes online and there's a bunch of stuff being built right now, uh, you know, we don't, we don't want to get, uh, you know, we don't want to get caught short-sighted. We want to be, be prepared for this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. Any further discussion under the school department section of the budget? There being no further discussion, that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $47,722,077 as set forth in Dr. Lyon's motions. All in motion, all in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. The library, Mr. Mayo. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. That the town raise and appropriate the sum of $1,877,097 for the library department and to provide, therefore, that the sum of $61,721 be appropriated by transfer to the library materials and supplies account from the library trust fund income available and the sum of $1,815,376 be raised and appropriated from tax levy as stated in the recommendation book. Is there a second? Second, Thank Mr. You. Mayo. The request for, for the library is $1,877,097. I am happy that the budget meets the required state standards and that Sunday hours are, are again uh, fully in action at the, at, at the library. Congra and also congratulations to the BB on its 100th anniversary. The recommendation for the library is $1,877,097. Mr. Sullivan. And the Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion on the motion under the library portion of the budget? There being no discussion, the motion is that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $1,877,097 for the library department. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Education. That the town raise and appropriate the sum of $2,163,000 $2,163,315 from tax levy as stated in the recommendation book. Is there a second? Mr. Mayo. Thank you. This budget represents an increase of $253,927 over last year and is based upon the enrollment of 106 students at the Northeastern Vocational School 
which is an increase of six from this year. Um, we currently do not have any students slated at uh, Minuteman Regional in Lexington, but we do anticipate having seven at Essex North Shore Regional in Danvers. But there is a caution. We do not know the exact numbers until the fall turns around, so we don't know what's exactly what's going to happen. But this amount also includes Wakefield's share of the yearly cost of the new vocational school, which at this point is $151,000. We do expect that yearly cost for construction to increase over the next few years and have accounted for those increases in our forecasting models. The vocational school has adopted many cost-saving measures, including entering the GIC. This amount tonight, however, is contingent upon the state funding Chapter 70 and regional transportation at currently stated levels. The requested and recommended amount is $2,163,315. Mr. Sullivan. Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion on the motion under the VOC section of the budget? There being no discussion, the motion is that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $2,163,315. All in favor? All opposed. Motion carries. Uh, unclassified, Mr. Mayo. That the town raise and appropriate the sum of $2,605,082 for the unclassified portion of the budget as stated in the recommendation book and provide that $1,998,577 be raised and appropriated from tax levy and that $606,505 be raised and appropriated from available funds. Second. Second. Thank you. Mr. Thank Mayo. You. Thank you. The recommended total for the unclassified portion of the budget is $2,605,082, um, an increase of $133,037 over the current year's budget, the bulk of which is an increase of $55,000 in the WCAT budget, which is the result of increase in capital franchise fees for capital from the recent Verizon cable contract. So we had to kind of account for some of the money that came into Verizon this year with the contract that Mr. Mullen did a great job negotiating for the town, and that's why that you see a little increase there. But it is important to note that cable fees do continue to plummet year over year. Less people are subscribing to cable TV, and that's where WCAT, local you know, channels like that, get their, get their funding from. So we're going to have to, as a community review, how we we help deliver these vital services in the coming budget. So that's just something for people to consider. The other two main reasons for the increase in this budget is the increase in the general insurance portion of the budget and Medicare portion, which is due to the fact of a higher payroll. Medicare, um, in, in the Medicare account, we pay the town share of 1.45% of payment for anyone hired after April 1st, 1986. The remaining portions of this are level funded. The recommended portion for unclassified portion of Article 1 is $2,605,082 with $1,998,577 from tax levy and $606,505 for available funds. Mr. Sullivan. The Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion? Mr. McLaughlin. Uh, Bob McLaughlin, 376 Water Street. One of my pet peeves here at town meeting over the last, I don't know how many years, I've brought this up at least several times to the uh, town councilors, is the Historical Commission and their $2,000 budget. You know, we're well over $100 million on this budget right here, and $2,000 for a town, we're blessed with all these old buildings, you know, that people from all over the country come to New England to visit, and, uh, and we've only got a $2,000 budget. Um, you know, we should have historic markers, a program to put historic markers on a lot of these homes that we have in town, the old buildings, uh, uh, stanchions, uh, historic stanchions, like a lot of other towns do. We should have a couple of programs going on here. And I brought it up to the councilors. I wish one of you, one, one of the councilors would just take the lead on this, right, and see if you can, uh, you know, uh, get the historic commission, uh, get them into a meeting and figure out what they could do for, you know, you know I'm not, I don't want to waste any money, but it's, it's good money to be spent because you get pe more people to come into your town. We've got a lot of beautiful old homes here, and uh, we should be promoting it, like, like Salem and Newburyport and a bunch of other cities and towns around here. So if it's just, this is just a comment, but if, I would really appreciate it if one of you councilors would just take the lead on this. I've asked you for the last three or four town meetings to do this, and this budget still stays at $2,000. I think it's a joke. You know, for you know, for, for for a town to have so much history, 
and uh, it, it, we're, we're not promoting it, in my opinion. But thank you very much. Any further discussion? Oh, Mr. Dombrowski. You can use the mic right there. Good evening, I'm Ned Dom Dombrowski, 15 Chestnut Street. Um, to your point, Mr. McLaughlin, um, I have been involved with this historical commission. I'm actually a liaison for the, uh, the town council. Um, I've attended almost every one of the meetings that we've had of late. Um, this discussion has come up multiple times. I have asked them uh, what they need. We've talked about the needs. Um, with respect to the historical markers that you mentioned, that it, they were actually available through the website and in a, a private homeowner could purchase one. Unfortunately, the person who made those has passed away. And we, along with a lot of other communities, are trying to find another resource to be able to find that. But those are actually funded through um, um, individual purchases that are made by um, a homeowner. Not, uh, the town doesn't place those. Um, but I have talked with, with the Historical Commission about other opportunities going forward. Uh, I, they're doing a lot of great work. Floral Way, with, with the help of DPW, is, is a great example of that. And a lot of the resources that the Historical Commission has identified they need, for example, Floral Way, uh, improving that area, improving fencing, restoring it back to at least the, the time when it, back in the 1940s. Um, that is all happening through other funding sources, through other uh, areas of our budget. So if there is a need, I'm working with our historical commission to identify where that need is and where we can draw the funds from. But the idea of just um, uh, putting additional funds into this particular line item is, does not appear to be necessary at this time. If that need does arise, I will certainly be the first, along with I know my colleagues, uh, advocating for that. But at this point, I think that we are appropriately funded. And as the additional needs arise, we're able to identify the sources. And if we have to um, bulk up this number, I'm confident we can. Thank you. Any further discussion under the unclassified portion of the budget? There being no further discussion, the motion is that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $2,605,082 for unclassified portion of the budget. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Benefits and administration, Mr. Mayo. That the sum of $19,483,514 be raised and appropriated from tax levy the benefits and administration as stated in the recommendation book. Is there a second? Thank you. Mr. Mayo. Thank you. The amount requested for benefits and administration reflects an increase of $1,195,705 over last year's budget. The program of benefits provided by the employee retirement system and the group insurance budget is set by statute with the employee's contribution to the group insurance cost determined by negotiations. The appropriation for the retirement system for fiscal year 2023 is $6,087,779, reflecting an increase of $488,352 over last year. The, the appropriation is based on the amortization schedule the town initiated in fiscal year 1988 and, updated, and updates every two years and is scheduled to end in fiscal year 2035. The workers' compensation budget request for fiscal year 2013 is increased by $16,000, which is really much more a reflection of the industry as a whole over the employee injuries that have been trending than our employee injuries, which have been trending lower uh, over the past few years and should result in a savings as going forward. The big, the big one here is, is, um, is group health insurance. In January 2012, the town of Wakefield was one of four communities who were able to join the state's group insurance commission. This is only able to occur due to the prompt action of the then Board of Selectmen in adopting the change in state law and subsequent agreement with the Public Employee Committee and the underlying unions. Due to this change in insurance, the town has saved millions of dollars. In fact, our 2000 in, in fact, in 2012, our cost of insurance was over $14 million without funding any of our OPEB obligations. This year, this figure includes OPED, and the amount is right around $1.4 million. This, this year is about the same, and OPEB is, is $1.4 million of that amount. And the movement to the GIC continues to pay dividends as our Human Resources Department, Amy Forziati and Karen Doucette, continue to work with our employees to enroll them or to help them enroll in cost-effective plans for both the town and for them. In fact, after this open enrollment period this year, um, working with our employees, we've saved about $160,000 uh, 
in premiums that we would have paid for, for pl plans that would do the same that these uh, employees are getting. So it really is a great job done by our staff. We also have an opt-out program, and we've saved about $660,000 a year in employees opting out of our insurance program. So despite the increase in health insurance costs this year, I think that we did, a, we did as much as we could to keep those premiums low. In fact, our 223 health insurance budget is still less than our budget in 2013, and we now fund OPEB. This recommendation for benefits administration portion of Article One is $19,483,514. Mr. Sullivan. And the Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion on the benefits and administration portion of the budget? There being no discussion, the motion is that the sum of $19,483,514 be raised and appropriated by tax levy. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Light Department motion. That the town appropriate the sum of $944,249 from the light operation account to the Contributory Retirement Pension Accumulation Fund account and to appropriate the sum of $1,491,951 from the light operation account to the employee's group insurance account and to appropriate the sum of $34,173 from the light operation account to the workers' compensation insurance account and that the balance of the receipts of the municipal gas and light department from July 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2023 be appropriated for the use of the department for other expenditures, provided, however, that if the income from said department shall exceed the expenses of the department for said period of time, the use of the excess in whole or in part shall be, termined, be determined by the Board of Light Commissioners. So, thank you. Thank Mr. Mayo. You. Thank you. The final portion of this article allows for the orderly transfer of funds from the different accounts within the Wake Municipal Gas and Light Department to the town pension group insurance, workers' comp, and retirement accounts, as the uh, employees of the MGLD partake in these programs, and they are funded not from the tax levy, but from the receipts of the Light Department. Mr. Sullivan. Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion under the Light Department? Motion before you is that the town appropriate the sum of $944,249 as set forth by Mr. Mayo. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you very All much. All right. On the Thank budget. you. All right. Article 2, before we hit light speed, is the capital outlay. All right. Frank Leone. Chairman of Capital Outlay, you are up. Welcome. that the town vote to raise and appropriate from tax levy the amount of $2,100,000 and transfer the amount of $862,000 from the sewer receipts account to the sewer department capital outlay account and the sum of $875,000 from the water receipts account to the water department capital outlay account to carry out the purpose of this article. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Leone. Read the second part or just go into it. Okay. Uh, this is our Capital Planning Committee and our recommendations. Uh, we've had the same committee for a while now. We've, um, we get a new member every year, it seems like, and a bunch of great people. Um, besides myself, we get Dan Calori, Dave Whitman, Bill Renzi, Tracy Clevesy, Jeff Gianta, and Frank Conti. I can attest as a group of great and well-rounded committee members with a very diverse knowledge of the request, requests brought before us. <clears throat> Uh, real quickly, I'll go over the process here. Uh, each fall, the town department submit requests to the Capital Planning Committee for consideration. The requests are compiled 
into a spreadsheet for evaluation and review. Uh, the initial request for this current year coming up was uh, $3,847,664. Uh, $3, the water was eight seventy five, dollars and the sewers eight sixty two. dollars the Capital Planning Committee invites all interested department heads to a meeting for discussions on all their requests. And we evaluate the requests and establish a rank and prior prioritizing of the funding. Um, we also work to explore potential options uh, for efficiency and savings. We establish a yearly plan to meet the town budget at expense of $2 million, which has been previously stated, we're hoping to go up 5% uh, every year now uh, to meet the rising costs. Our meetings are now all via Zoom, and if anyone out there was interested to hear what is presented to us or to hear our discussions, you're more than welcome, usually in February and early March. <clears throat> the full risk, a list of recommended items can be found on pages 25 and 26 of your booklet, and this, I'm just going to go over a few of the highlights. Uh, every year we usually uh, have about three cruises, three police cruises to replace uh, anything that's deficient from the fleet. This year uh, we were able to just do two cruises uh, with the recommendation of the chief and give them a new uh, prisoner transport van, which they've been looking for for a while. Um, there's a Ventrix snow, snow sidewalk machine, snow blower, plow, you can see the picture right there. There are a couple already around town, but this one's specifically going to be for the uh, high school and Woodville campus area. And the loader currently uh, operating for the town is about 10 to 12 years old, so um, we're going to supply a new loader. I want to note that normally an item of this value, $270,000, needs to be leased, so paid over three, or five, three years or five years. Uh, we were able to fit this entire item in the budget this year and not increase our lease, item, lease line item. Uh, some highlights on the buildings. Uh, the Woodville School is going to get a new gym floor this year, or refinished, I should say, not a new gym floor. Uh, Civic Center bathroom upgrades down in the basement area, and long-awaited carpeting in the BB library that they've been waiting a couple years for. <clears throat> Some other big items here, aggregate screener, which will be um, located down at the pit area. That will allow the town to screen some of the material that's down there for usage by all the citizens. If we need to go down there and get some loom or some gravel, they'll be able to screen it so they don't have to export it and to buy new stuff to bring in new stuff for, for our use. So that's a, that was a good item, and we also were able to buy that straight out without leasing it. Um, 125000 for the Spalding Street uh, for sewer main replacement down by the lake. Um, all that has to be pumped uphill, so that there's a lot of work that needed to be done there just to get that and make sure it stayed up to code. And uh, Walton School Playground, 160,000. Over the last couple of years, we've we've tried and we have replaced one uh, playground at a school uh, every year, except for the year when we, uh, except for the COVID year. But um, this year was the Walton. The Woodville hasn't been done yet. We approved it last year, but that will be getting done this summer as well, and hopefully. Um, some magic can happen and Walton can happen this year too, this summer, I mean. But the, these are the funds for that. <clears throat> so the recommended appropriation for the tax levy is $2.1 million. The water enterprise is $875,000 and the sewer enterprise is $862,000. And just always good to remind you that the water and sewer are funded by retained earnings from the water and sewer payments, not from the tax levy. That's it. Mr. Sullivan. The Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Discussion under the Capital Outlay Article 2 motion. This working? Yeah. Uh, Bob Mitchell, 6 Balding Street. Just two smaller questions on this. Uh, one on, first one on the building, we're in the Galvin. I'm just asking, we're spending $12,000 for door handles. Would that be, I mean, this is almost a brand new building. Would that be covered under for the prior, you know, that whole, shouldn't the guy who built the building cover that? Just a quick question. I mean, just no, quick it's, um, it's yeah. been, what, seven years now. It's, okay. it's past its, That's past its warranty time. time. Just like last year, okay. I think we did the faucets. It, uh, same kind of issue where it, it's, it's beyond the coverage. Beyond the coverage, okay. 
and just one quick on five common this isn't a big issue to me but we're putting 70 grand into repairing it which i think is is obviously fine i don't question that at all but i'm just asking i know a tenant is moving out and i'm just asking what the rent is that tenant was paying that we're going to lose and how that would offset this 72,000 is that uh, steve do you know the answer to that yeah and that, that's it thank you eight hundred dollars a month oh well, short money okay <laughs> thank you any further discussion? A motion under Article 2. No, 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 there being no discussion, the town votes to raise and appropriate from the tax levy the amount of $2,100,000 as the transfer is set forth in the motion. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. And now we, we swoop to Article 8. Tom, Steve, how cool are we? What a cool town you guys are in. Just a minute, little Joey Conray up on the stand again. All right, Article 8. Where are we here? Article 8, refuse. That the town raise and appropriate from tax levy the sum of $2,292,46 to carry out the purpose of this article. Is there a second? second. Mr. Conway. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The Department of Public Works is requesting $2,292,046 for the collection and disposal of refuse, collection and processing of recycling, and the operation of the yard waste program at the Nahad Street Yard Waste site. Mr. Sullivan, you up on this? Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion? Under Article 8, refuse. There being no discussion, the motion is the town rate raise an appropriate from the tax levy the sum of $2,292,046. All in favor? All opposed? Short and sweet, Mr. Conway. I love calling him Mr. Conway. Article 9. Drainage. This will be a two-thirds vote because we have an appropriation. Why, Mr. Mullen? Remind me again. Borrow, oh, we're borrowing. Okay, so this will be a two-thirds vote. Okay, Mr. Mr. Renault, town engineer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. That the town appropriate the sum of nine hundred thousand dollars for the completion of repairs to the drainage systems throughout the town, and to raise this uh, this appropriation, the treasurer with the approval of the town council is authorized to borrow the sum of $900,000 under and pursuant to general laws chapter 44 section 71 or any other enabling authority and to issue bonds or notes of the town therefore. Is there a second? second. Mr. Renault. Thank you Mr. Moderator. Article 9 requests borrowing authorization to fund various repairs to the town's drainage collection system. As noted in previous town meeting presentations, Public Works annually reviews its drainage inventory data and inspects current conditions of the drainage network in conjunction with planned capital projects and the roadway paving program. Portions of the drainage collection system requiring replacement, expansion, relocation, or upsizing are identified and scheduled for repair. These types of drain repairs are typically funded through the annual capital budget. However, a larger need was identified between Vernon Street and Daniel Road due to, the exist to an existing capacity uh, issue and poor pipe conditions. Approval of Article 9 will provide $900,000 to fund the repairs for the drainage to Daniel, uh, uh, the Vernon Street to Daniel Road section of the drainage network and to fund the DPW's drainage maintenance needs for fiscal 23. Public Works respectfully request your support of Article 9. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Mr. Sullivan. Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion on the motion under Article 9, drainage? Okay, this is going to be two-thirds, so if it's unanimous, we don't have to count. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> uh, that the town appropriate the sum of 900000 for the completion of the repairs to the drainage system throughout the town under raise the appropriation. The tr with the raise the appropriation, the treasurer will approve, with the approval of town council, is authorized to borrow the sum of 900000 under and pursuant to General Laws Chapter 44, Section 
section 7 dash or sub 1 or any other enabling authority and other issue bonds or notes of the town therefore to carry out the purpose of this article all in favor all opposed is anyone opposed and I can't see it motion carries unanimously I'm reading it for bond council Mr. Mullen thank you all right article 10 Hearts Hill wastewater treatment Mr. Conway's back up that the town appropriate the sum of five million dollars for the purpose of replacing the Hearts Hill water tower including design construction and other costs related thereto and to raise this appropriation the treasurer with the approval of the town council is authorized to borrow said sum under and pursuant to general law chapter 44 section 8 4 or any other enabling authority which may include the local water assistance program of the Massachusetts Water Authority and to issue bonds or notes of the town therefore to carry out the purpose of this article is there a second Mr. Conway. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. So um, we included a slide tonight. I think that is the next one in the deck for the folks at WCAT. Oh, I apologize. Perfect. Um, so I'll just apologize ahead of time. Anybody that heard uh, Public Works bring this up at either the Finance Committee or the Council, uh, this is essentially the same presentation, but we wanted to provide a little context to this. So what this tank is, uh, the background to it, it was installed in 1927. This sits up at the intersection of Sydney Street and Dillaway Street. Uh, it sits at 47 feet wide and 49 feet high, and currently the capacity is 640,000 gallons. So what does this tank do? This tank provides the town hydraulic grade line stabilization. It serves as a SCADA control point for the town's three MWRA connections. And what that means is, based on the level in this tank, tells our feeds into the MWRA whether or not to pump more water into Wakefield or not. This tank acts as a system equalizer for fire flow conditions. So can you imagine uh, the heavy fire that we saw at the Baptist Church? This provided some of the initial water so that the town didn't go uh, without any in certain neighborhoods. and also provides buffering capacity for demand fluctuations. So to date, Public Works has performed due diligence research that we wanted to understand the following. So is there any feasibility of potentially abandoning this? Is there something else that we could have done uh, to get the same result that's important to our system? We wanted to check into the suitability of the site for a long-term replacement. We also wanted to look into material options for a replacement. Could we use concrete or do we have to use an alternative material? The findings that came out of that is that the tank is critical to the distribution system operation and it cannot be removed. The site has also been found to be suitable for a replacement tank to be installed. So if approved tonight, the next step would be to begin working with the abutting neighborhood to accomplish this project. So in closing, Article 10 is requesting to borrow the funding necessary to remove and replace the existing water tank. The tank, as I mentioned, was installed in 1927 and is approaching 100 years in service. It's recommended that $5 million be appropriated by borrowing for the purpose of this article. Mr. Sullivan. The Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion on the motion under Article 10? That's actually pretty cool stuff, Joe. I like that. Thank you. Ready? That the town appropriate the sum of $5 million for the purposes of replacing the Hearts Hill water tower including design, construction, and other costs related thereto, and to rule this appropriation to the treasurer Rule, raise this appropriation. The treasurer, will, with the approval of the town council, is authorized to borrow the sum under sum under said sum under and pursuant to General Laws Chapter 44, Section 8, Sub 4, or any other enabling authority, which may include the local water system assistance program of the MWRA, and to issue bonds or notes of the town thereof and carry out the purposes of this article. This one is also a two-thirds required vote because it's borrowing. All in favor? All opposed? Anybody out there that I don't see? That one carries unanimously. Uh, Article 11, the railroad crossing. Oh, 
Is that on? Great. That the town appropriate the sum of $2 million for the design and or construction of railroad crossing improvements and to raise this appropriation, the treasurer with the approval of the town council is authorized to borrow the sum of $2 million under and pursuant to general laws chapter 44 section 71 or any other enabling authority and to issue bonds or notes of the town therefore to carry out the purpose of this article. Is there a second? Thank you. I'm sure that we all remember the lengthy closing of the Broadway crossing as well as the horn-free or lack thereof a horn-free zone discussions. Although the changes that we've made were barely adequate to achieve quiet zone status for now, we are very aware that in a few years the FRA will be back, Federal Railroad Association, and we could very well be deficient once again. Funding of this article will help make sure that we well exceed the FRA standards. So I want to, um, that's really why we're here. I also want to thank the hard work by our engineering department and the great assistance of our many systems, uh, and the great assistance of many citizens. We were able to secure a $1.2 million earmark from the federal government to improve railroad crossings, Broadway in particular. This earmark was sponsored by our Congressman Seth Moulton, who personally guided it through a sometimes disjointed House and Senate, ultimately calling me on my cell phone, interrupted me during physical therapy, but it was a good call to get. It was a $100 million call, so I took it um, one evening to personally relay the good news. Therefore, we may not need the entire $2 million. I'm hoping we don't. But as I've learned over the years, I don't count on any of these monies until I have them in the bank. Uh, so the article motion is for the full amount. Again, I want to thank the citizens for their assistance and patience in regard to, these, to this issue and others. And now, Mr. Moderator, Town Engineer Bill Renault will briefly explain some of the technical items involved. Article 11 requests $2 million to maintain the town's compliance with the Federal Rail Administration's quiet zone. For some quick background on the town's quiet zone, uh, the town has six accurate crossings as shown on the current slide. Uh, four of the six crossings have additional safety measures installed as you can see in the photos. Greenwood, Broadway, Chestnut, and Prospect. Uh, these measures include center, idol, uh, center median islands, one-way travel restrictions, um, and additional signage. The additional safety measures keep the town below the national risk index with horns, so trains passing through the town will not blow horns at each crossing. In fall of 2020, the FRA required the town to recalculate and resubmit safety measures for the town's crossing and make adjustments to some of those constructed measures. After several iterations of design, the FRA approved the town's modification proposal in the fall of 21. That proposal included enhancements at the Broadway crossing to reconfigure three driveway aprons adjacent to the tracks, as well as to reinstall the median curb islands with modified limits. In addition to the work at Broadway, a new yellow bollard median was installed for a portion of the, uh, the Greenwood crossing. As Mr. Mayo noted in his remarks, the town is currently compliant with the FRA's quiet zone requirements due to these updated safety measures I just mentioned. However, the town sits just below the current risk index threshold. We are required to provide compliance reporting every three years to FRA. As part of that reporting, adjustments are made to the calculations and thresholds based on current traffic counts and accident history at each of these crossings. There is a high likelihood of the town, there's a high likelihood the town will be out of compliance at some time in the near future without further safety enhancements. The funding for Article 11 proposes the installation of new quad gate systems at two crossings the Broadway crossing in either Prospect or Albion based upon future traffic counts that will be completed. The, quiet, uh, the quad gate system provides much higher safety protections and will ensure the town maintains its quiet zone compliance for years to come. I respectfully request affirmative action for Article 11 and we happy to answer any questions. Mr. Sullivan. The Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion on the motion under Article 11. This also re require a two-thirds vote. The motion is that the town appropriate the sum of $2 million for the design and or construction of the railroad crossing improvements and to raise this appropriation, the treasurer will with the approval of, with the approval of town council is authorized to borrow the sum of $2 million under and pursuant to general laws chapter 44 section 7 sub 1 or any other enabling authority and to issue bonds or notes of the town therefore to carry out the purpose of this article. All in favor? All opposed? Anybody opposed that I can't see? 
Uh, that is unanimous. Thank you, Mr. Renault. Article 12 is, will be explained by Mr. Mayo. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Mr. Moderator. That the town vote pursuant to General Law Chapter 40, Section 59, and General Law Chapter 23A, Sections 3A and 3F, and all applicable regulations thereunder, to A, approve the tax increment financing agreement among Fast Cap Systems Corporation doing business as Nanormark Laboratories, IRG, Wakefield Limited Partnership, and the town, substantiating the form which is on file with the town clerk, TIP agreement for improvements to the real property located at 7 Audubon Road, Wakefield, Mass., which property is shown on the assessor's maps at map 36W, block 30, lot 007, and as more fully described in the TIF agreement, which agreement provides for real estate tax exemptions at the exemption rate schedule set forth therein, authorize the town council to execute and deliver the TIF agreement and any documents relating thereto, and C, authorize the town council to approve submission to the Massachusetts Economic Assistance Coordinating Council of the TIF agreement and an economic development incentive program, local incentive only application, together with any associated documents are relating to the project as described in the TIF agreement, and to take such other and further actions as may be necessary or appropriate to carry out the purposes of this article. Is there a second? Mr. Mayo. Thank you. Um, a number of years ago, I presented the then Board of Selectmen with the concept of tax increment financing, or TIF for short. The concept centers around the premise that if a company is willing to expend money in your community by increasing the value of property, and the company will create permanent jobs by doing so, the company may apply for, and the town may grant exemptions for a specific period of time on the extra taxes generated by the property improvements. Back then, the community needed to be granted special authorization by the state to extend this financial to. Now, they've made it so any municipality can do it. The TIF agreement must be approved by the town council, town meeting, and the state. We are here for the third approval necessary as the state and town council have already approved the agreement. Through the hard work of Erin Kokinder, our Director of Economic and Community Development, Victor Santanello, our Director of Assessments, and our wonderful relationship with Maria DiStefano, Northeast Regional Director for the Massachusetts Office of Business Development, I am thrilled to present to you Wakefield's first TIF agreement. Through, the, through their joint efforts, Erin, Victor, and Maria, Nanoramic Laboratories has been convinced to leave the Seaport District in Boston to relocate and refurbish the property located at 7 Audubon Road, which is that white building as you go past the Sheridan and sneak up the back road to Marketplace. You can all see the building, it's like a white building set back. Nanoramic will be leasing the space for 10 years, or at least 10 years, and will be, expanding an and will be expending an estimated $1.7 million in hard and soft costs on the building. The increase in assessed value attributed to the TIF will be $325,000 per year, and the exempted taxes will amount to $36,461.75 inclusive over a five-year period, or an average of $7,300 per year. By the way, this is an exemption of taxes that we would never collect but for the company relocating here. That's an important point to make, that they didn't come here and didn't do the work on the property. We wouldn't, we wouldn't uh, get the taxes anyway. Nanoramic plans to, or is required to, I should say, create 60 full-time jobs here in Wakefield as part of this agreement. The company will also receive $106,000 in state tax credits. There are many safeguards built in this agreement, including annual reporting to the town and the state regarding capital spent and jobs created. Simply, if they don't perform, they don't get the tax breaks. Nanoramic is exactly the type of business that we would love to attract to town as they engage in the creation of manufacturing of electrodes for rechargeable Li-ion batteries. We will be on the cutting edge of green business, and don't ask me any technical explanations because I don't have them. <laughs> so why did Nanoramic decide on Wakefield as they also look at Natick and Marlboro? According to them, location was key, ac easy access and close to the talent pool that lives around Boston. Also, the rents were four times more in the seaport than they could get here. Also, these businesses needed more infrastructure to grow, not easily found in the city. According to the company, the Wakefield location 
still makes NanoRamic feel like a Boston-based company. But I also think that the biggest part was that the professional and welcoming efforts of Erin and Victor played a great role, as well as the amenities that Wakefield offers. And I can't wait to welcome NanoRamic to the Wakefield community. They're already talking about getting involved in the chamber, going to the lake, and things like that. Wakefield also receives great PR from this event. Already an article has been penned in the Boston Business Journal. This is exactly what we envisioned when we created the economic development position. For me, this is a win-win-win for the community, the company, and the environment. I hope that we can present many more of these to the community in the future. Mr. Sullivan. The Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion under the motion under Article 12? There being no discussion, the motion is that the town vote pursuant to General Laws Chapter 4059 and Chapter 23, 3A and F to apply this tax increment financing agreement as set forth by Mr. Mayo. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carried. Thank you. And um, the CFO of NanoRamic was going to be here, but um, she unfortunately is sick like the rest of her family. So, um, But I'm sure we'll have her into the council to, uh, when she comes in so we can talk to her anyway and people can see her. Thank you. Uh, 13, Article 13, adopting provisions under General Laws Chapter 59, Section 5. Is this? Oh, Victor, Mr. Assessor is up. Thank you. You're going to explain all this, right? Yeah, good. Give it your best shot, Victor. All right, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the motion is that the town accept the provisions of General Law Chapter 59, Section 5, Clause 56, to carry out the purpose of this article. Is there a second? Well, relative to this clause, um, Town of Wakefield Board of Assessors and Town Meeting had adopted this, I'm thinking about 10 or 12 years ago. One little portion of it I did not catch at the time, it had a sunset clause. But in consultation with our veteran service folks, our Veterans Council, they're asking their regional towns or what have you to please go through your books and resubmit. So we're happy to resubmit. What this does, it enables your Board of Assessors to grant tax relief to National Guard's folks that may be called up uh, into active service for, I believe it's a period of 180 days. And any time during that fiscal year, the Board of Assessors can, under their purview, grant tax relief to those folks. And this will be good for three fiscal years total. And I'll remember the sunset clause and be back here in three years to redo it. Mr. Sullivan. The Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion on the motion under Article 13? The motion is that the town accept the provisions of General Laws Chapter 59, Section 5, Clause 56 to carry out the purpose of this article. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Article 14 is recodification of zoning bylaws. Mr. Mayo. That the town raise and appropriate $50,000 from tax levy to carry out the purpose of this article. Is there a second? Thank you. Section 7-5 of the town charter requires that the town council appoint a bylaw review committee in years that end in a 2 or a 7. This committee will be charged with reviewing the town's bylaws and to make a report with recommendations to town meeting concerning any proposed revisions, recodifications, or amendments which the committee deems necessary or desirable. The committee appointed in 2017 focused on the general bylaw. This committee will also focus, will do some of the general bylaw, but this committee will really focus on the zoning bylaw. Because of the extremely technical nature of the zoning bylaw, it is important that professional assistance of it is available to this committee. This article is designed to help fund the cost of that expertise. So in a year or so, we will see a report of this committee along with recommended, recommended amendments. The Town Council and Finance Committee both supported this article. 
and we'll Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, from the Finance Committee. Now. Speak for himself. <laughs> I was going to say. Sure, this is what I get to do. Yeah, the Finance <laughs> Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion on the motion under Article 14? There being no discussion, that the town raise and appropriate $50,000 from the tax levy to carry out the purpose of this article. All in favor? All opposed. Motion carries. Article 15. Give me a second here. Article 15. Mr. Mayo, this is. Oh, it's Mr. Oh, okay. Dan, retiree COLA adjustment. Thank you very much. Mr. Sherman. Oh, wait, you have a PowerPoint? It's a joke. Thank you. Article 15, that the town approve the Wakefield Retirement Board's vote to increase the maximum base amount of which the cost of living adjustment is calculated from 14,000 to 16,000 for fiscal year 2023 and subsequent years in accordance with general laws chapter 32, section 103 sub J to carry out the purpose of this article. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Mr. Sherman. Thank you. Um, I, besides finance committee, I also sit on the retirement board. Um, I'm an actuary, so I've been on the board for 20 some years and from time to time, there are uh, changes in Chapter 32 uh, retirement system, and some of those changes are automatic by the state. Some require local option, and this COLA base is one of those local options. So the way the cost of living adjustment works now is that if some if a retiree is receiving, let's say, $20,000 per year as their pension, and the board votes in the spring to say we're going to grant a 3% um, cost of living adjustment effective July 1 following, uh, it's limited to the base. And in this case, the current base is $14,000. And what, what the retirement board would like to do is increase that base to sixteen thousand. Uh, about five or six, seven years ago, we increased it from twelve thousand up to fourteen, so we're back. Um, and you see the bullet points above. I, I won't read through them exactly, but we can increase as those bases anywhere from a, a, at least increments of a thousand dollars. Nothing you can do two thousand, three thousand, but you can't do five hundred. We have 341 retirees and beneficiaries in the system, and they're receiving on average $33,000. Um, we've got 340, I'm sorry, 41 disabled who are receiving uh, benefits th roughly of $31,000 each. So all these people who are at the average or above are not receiving 3% of their entire pension. They're receiving some portion of it, maybe 1%, 1.5%. Um, if they're receiving less than $14,000, they get the full 3% on their current pension. So um, right now, what we'd like to do is increase it to $16,000 so that each year, the maximum increase in their pension would be $480. Uh, so the average person, average retiree, would see an increase of just 1.45%. And as we've seen now in the last couple of months, inflation is significantly higher than that. Retirement system is not a social security um, system. We do not contribute um, our 6.2% for employees um, pay to uh, social security. We do the 1.45% for Medicare. And what I try to do is estimate the cost. So you'll see as of January 1st of 22, um, I ran an evaluation of the system and said, okay, you know, what, what is this gonna cost? Clearly it's gonna cost money to increase retirees uh, pensions. So our total accrued liability is roughly $210 million. We have $157 million in assets. So our unfunded liability is roughly $52.6 million. We're about 75% funded, which is a little above our peers. Uh, we're actually in better shape than many others. And our appropriation that, that's expected for fiscal year 24 is roughly $7 million. So that's where we are today, so to speak. When we increase the COLA base from 14,000 to 16,000, 
Um, our liability goes up to $211.8 uh, million. Dollars. Our, of course, our assets don't change, $54 million. So our, there's an increase in our um, total liability and our unfunded liability. And our funded ratio would drop down to 74.4%. So what would it do for our fiscal year appropriation would be an increase of roughly $200,000. Of course, this is all hinged on as if this change had occurred January 1st of 22. Um, it will not affect our appropriation for until fiscal year 26 because we'll be doing a, or the state is doing a full valuation as of January 1st of 22 and that was in the past. So the next valuation that's done for this retirement system will be January 1 of 24 and that valuation affects the fiscal year 26 appropriation. So although we are um, granting if the town meeting approves this modification to the COLA base, uh, we will be uh, having additional cost, but it will not be um, in, in a cost until fiscal year 26, um, another three years um, after tonight's uh, 23 budget uh, votes. So um, the retirement board was unanimous in increasing to $16,000. And uh, with that, um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Mr. Sullivan. The Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion on the motion under Article 15? Yeah, hi, Bob Mitchell, Six Ball. I'm generally in favor of this. I just have one, one general question, because you threw so many numbers at us, I couldn't keep track of all. I know you have the low, a lot of people under 14,000, and the average is 33. But out of all the participants, what's the highest retirement payout to an individual? I, I'm just not that familiar with it. Look or ballpark. I'm not going to pull yeah, into it, just ballpark. Just, I'm just we we education. have, um, yeah. usually it's police and fire who've got, you know, get 80%. Um, of their pension, uh, their 80 percent of their final sal yeah. average salary. Yeah. I imagine we have some that are over $100,000. Yeah, I'm getting nods over here. I'm looking at retirement okay. board staff. Um, but yes, we do have people at well over $100,000 in terms of their pension. So if you think about that, you know, for them, it's not 3 percent. They're getting like, uh, you know, a tenth of a percent of increase in their COLA. So it's very, very, very small for those at that income level. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? There being no discussion, the motion is that the town approve the Wayfield Retirement Board's vote to increase the maximum base on which the cost of willing adjustment is calculated from 14000 to 16000 for year two fiscal year 2023. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Sherman, you're still up, right? Article 16, which is retirement survivor adjustment, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you'll explain to us. <laughs> I'll do my best. Yes, as an actuarial. Yeah, that the town approved the Wakefield Retirement Board's vote to increase the member survivor minimum allowance from $250 to $500 per month for surviving spouses of deceased employees for fiscal year 2023 and subsequent years in accordance with General Laws Chapter 32, Section 12, Sub 2, Sub D, to carry out the purpose of this article. Second. Second, thank you. Mr. Sherman. So we had, unfortunately, um, a recent death uh, among our uh, active employees, and um, the staff had noticed and brought to the board's attention that the uh, spouse of this employee was going to receive a pension uh, that was less than $500 um, Per, uh, per year, uh, I'm sorry, per month. So uh, they brought to our attention, most retirement systems have increased that um, amount from $250 to $500, which is in the state uh, statute. You can't go higher than that, but um, every community retirement system has the option of increasing it from 250 to 500. So they brought it to our attention, retirement board unanimously said, um, yeah, this is crazy. We need to increase this minimum to 500. Uh, dollars per month. Um, we only have four beneficiaries um, in the system um, that are receiving less than 500 uh, per month. Just a quick scroll down. 
And so um, we, we may have some more in the future. Uh, it's less likely uh, because obviously as pay increases go up and pay, uh, this, this benefit is based on the pay levels of the individual who, uh, who had died. So it's got minimal effect and it's gonna be reduced effect going forward unless the state changes the $500 uh, minimum to something higher. So um, again, I did the same analysis where I'm showing the accrued liability uh, before and after. And the increase, as you can see, is extremely uh, modest um, and roughly uh, $60,000. And if this change uh, occurs, like the COLA change, it won't be effective until the fiscal year in 26, and it'll increase our appropriation by about $18,000 uh, starting at fiscal year uh, 26. So again, this is something that the retirement board felt um, we just, it's at a minimum, we just need to get um, these four people, uh, these survivors of deceased employees up to a, a $500 per month minimum. Mr. Sullivan. The Finance Committee recommends favorable action. Any discussion on the uh, motion under Article 16? Be no discussion. The motion is that the town approve the Wakefield Board's vote to increase the member survivor minimum from 250 per month to 500 per month for si survivor benefits, uh, spouses, deceased employees. All in favor? All opposed. Hey, I just want to take a minute to say, Thank you. I, I think I speak on most of the town. Dan sits on two boards. He provides this town with, for years, with this kind of actual aerial expertise that is just invaluable. So your civic, I'm not kidding you, you know, I'll give you a hard time about everything, but I really do appreciate, and I think everybody else does, the, the, the invaluable work that you provide the town uh, for these kind of things. And, I, you know, we take for granted, you know, your FinCom stuff, but this kind of stuff is also exhibits that, that kind of thing. So I just appreciate that. You're welcome. Th thank you. Thank you. Thanks. I don't think he's going anywhere, but I just want to figure it would be a good time to point that out. Unless he retires to Utah. Uh, Article 17. Who we got? We have Mr. McGrail. All right. Mr. McGrail, you're going to read your motion under Article 17. I am. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Article 17, the town vote to amend the zoning bylaw town of Wakefield by amending the existing Wakefield zoning map by changing the zoning district designation of so much of the property known and numbered as 343 Albion Street and shown on the Wakefield assessor's maps as parcel 1AA on map 08 as is currently within the single residence district to the general residence district is shown on the map on file with the town clerk. Also amending the zoning text, section 190-7, zoning map, such that the revised zoning map bears a new date, the first sentence of section 197.a is replaced with the following. A. Except as set forth below, the above zoning districts are shown on the map entitled Wakefield Zoning Map, dated June 1, 2022. Is there a second? Second. Mr. McGrail. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, members of town meeting. Uh, Attorney Brian McGrail, residing at 81 Outlook Road in Wakefield. Uh, also here representing uh, a client, Acon Spruce Properties who is the owner of property known and numbered as 343 Albion Street, which is the subject of this article before you tonight. Acorn Spruce is one of the sponsors of this article. There are also co-sponsors of this, of this article comprised of Wakefield citizens and registered voters, some of who live in the neighborhood of the subject property. Two of the co-sponsors of this article are Mary Doyle Kelly and David Kelly, longstanding residents of the neighborhood who my client and I have worked closely with on this article in an effort to get it approved by town meeting tonight. We'll also hear from David, David Kelly uh, in support of this article tonight. Although the picture isn't very clear, what I'm trying to illustrate is that the subject property, 343 Albion Street, is located at the corner of Albion Street 
and Jordan Avenue in close proximity to the Stoneham town line. It also is virtually di directly across from Paul Street, which serves as the exit from the Doyle School. So if you're leaving downtown Wakefield heading to Stoneham on Albion Street, you probably have seen this property. It's a little gas station at the corner of Jordan Avenue, a repair shop at the corner of Jordan Avenue. There's some photographs of the property. The property uh, currently is the site, as I've mentioned, of an old neighborhood gasoline filling station and auto repair facility that time has passed by. As was typical in the early uh, and mid-1900s, small service stations of this nature existed to serve neighborhoods before big branded oil gas stations began to pop up everywhere and pretty much competed them out of business. This station was successfully operated by members of the Doyle family for decades. When I was a child in the 1960s, my grandparents lived right around the corner on Fox Road, and they would frequent the filling station for gas and repairs, just like everybody else in the neighborhood at the time. In approximately 1993, the Doyle family went through a permitting process with the town to separate or divide a number of homes that they owned on Jordan Avenue, which were contiguous and connected to the filling station land. So in essence, it was one big piece of land. And they wanted to make them independent house lots, and the filling station was put on its own independent lot. And the filling, filling station and auto uh, repair business continued uh, as time went on, and they were successful in separating a number of houses heading up Jordan Avenue on the right-hand side that were all one piece of land. That was done in 1993 before the Zoning Board of Appeals. My client, Acorn Spruce, acquired the filling station approximately 10 years ago and has continued the auto repair aspect of the filling station, but the pumping of gas is no longer taking place on the property. Despite being located uh, in a residential zoning district, the current use of the property is allowed to continue as a legal non-conforming use, as allowed by state law and by our zoning bylaw. These pictures kind of de depict the residential aspect of this neighborhood. It shows you um, heading uh, on Albion Street towards downtown with the filling station on the left. Um, and then it also depicts the filling station on the right heading up Jordan Avenue into the residential neighborhood. But it's really designed to show you how uh, this property, as I've mentioned, which is legally non-conforming, um, is within this residential zoning district, right, uh, right on the line of the single residence district and the general residence district. Um, for for non-lawyers, the term legal non-conforming use can be somewhat confusing, um, and I'd like to explain. Um, uses that are in effect at a particular time when they're either prior to zoning going into effect in a town or pri prior to a zoning bylaw being implemented that would not allow that use. So they already exist either prior to zoning or prior to a bylaw that would prohibit that use are legal non-conforming. What that means is they're legal because in essence they're grandfathered, but they're non-conforming to the current bylaws of the town. This is a situation for this filling station. It's legal because the filling station use started circa 1920, prior to when the first zoning bylaw went into effect in Wakefield which was 1925, approximately 1925. As is often the case with legal non-conforming commercial uses of this nature, where you have a grandfather commercial use in a residential zone, friction and disputes can develop. Um, you take auto repair and filling stations in the middle of a residential area, it can become uncomfortable for both parties over time. Um, it often results in complaints to the building inspector for things such as excessive noise, overflow parking, into a neighborhood, storage of vehicles, alleged allowed extensions of non-conforming uses, which has happened over the years at this property like many non-conforming uses. Um, oftentimes, as in this circumstance, they end up in disputes at the Zoning Board of Appeals um, for them to resolve the matter and rule on, on the matters. And, and then uh, often they can end up in litigation, either in land court or superior court. And this property has been to superior court. In this case, however, the friction between the legal non-conforming use and the residential neighborhood actually led to constructive cons uh, discussions between ACORN and the neighborhood led by the Kellys to come up with a plan that could benefit 
and be acceptable to all concerned. And that plan is in front of you in the form of Article 17 tonight. Most of the subject property uh, is located in the single residence district, but a very small portion is actually already located in the general residence district. This article proposes to rezone the entire subject property to the general residence district to allow for the removal of the legal non-conforming filling station auto repair use and to allow it to be replaced with a two-family dwelling on the property. Two-family dwellings are allowed in the general residence district, but they're not allowed in the single residence district. That will fit right into the residential neighborhood, and it will also get rid of a non-conforming use and have a conforming use that conforms fully with our bylaw. I want to point out in this slide uh, that this concept is not unique to this neighborhood. In approximately 2012, a legal non-conforming business use known as Oxbow Pet Shop, that some of you folks might fondly, fondly remember, uh, right actually right next door to the subject property, was converted to legal use as three two-family dwellings. There was enough land to do that. So now uh, these three two-family dwellings uh, are right on Albion Street. They used to be a commercial use. So this has actually happened uh, for the positive in this neighborhood in the past. This article allows for, for the removal of the legal non-conforming filling station and auto repair facility use from the residential neighborhood, a benefit to the neighborhood, and allows Acorn Spruce to use the lot for a two-family dwelling, a reasonable use and a financial, uh, reasonable financial result for Acorn. This is the plan that's referenced in the article. Um, you can see the zoning line uh, on the right side. You can see a tiny piece of the property is already zoned general residence at the top. Uh, and you've got Albion Street uh, and, and Jordan Ave. Um, as you can see, um, this property is right on the cusp of the general residence district. You can see the line on the right-hand side. As I've mentioned, a small piece is already general residence. And you might notice that Albion Street uh, in front of the property, the actual is street is zoned general residence. So this property is, is pretty much uh, surrounded uh, by, uh, by uh, general residence. And I think it's important to note that not only does this article benefit all interested parties, but it's also good planning and fits our zoning scheme and blends into the neighborhood. Uh, that is why the planning board which, Mr. Moderator, you do need a recommendation from the planning board on this article before there's a vote. But as you will hear, the planning board, after public hearing with questions and discussion, Thank unanimously you. recommended approval of this article uh, by town meeting. So this slide further illustrates how the subject property is surrounded by the general residence district and it fits right into that district. Um, I've circled the area of the property. The yellow to the right and in front of the property is already general residence. And, and uh, to the left is single residence. And you can kind of see that small corner um, of the property, the, the, the general residence line. Actually, a lot of the properties going up Jordan Ave, the, the rear end of those properties are currently zoned general residence. I think it's important to note that two family uses are not unique to this neighborhood. So it's nothing that's like we're putting a two family house in the, in where all single families exist. Um, the properties at 340 and 344 Albion Street, which are right across the street uh, from this property, are classified, it's zoned general residence, and those two properties are classified by our assessors as two family dwellings. As I've already mentioned, the Oxbow Pet Shop property. Uh, has three two-family dwellings, and those are immediately adjacent to this property. And then also, uh, 58 Jordan Avenue, uh, as you head up from this property, which abuts this property directly on the Jordan Avenue side, uh, is a two-family dwelling. That's actually located in the single residence district, but it's a legal non-conforming two-family dwelling on that property. So the concept of two-family dwellings um, in this neighborhood is not unique. Uh, I think it's important to state that I was informed today that there has been some misstatements on the internet that this zoning change, is, if approved, will allow multifamily building to go on this subject property. That is not true. 
multifamily buildings are not allowed by our zoning bylaw and general resident zoning districts. If this article passes, the subject property can only accommodate no more than one two-family dwelling under our zoning bylaw. I want to make it clear that this lot cannot accommodate two two-family dwellings. In the general residence district, you need to have 8,000 square feet for a two-family dwelling. This lot is just over 11,000 square feet. So the lot, it's not like two two-family dwellings will, will be put there. Only one two-family dwelling could go there. So with all of that said, on behalf of my client, on behalf of the Kellys and other co-sponsors of this article, I respectfully ask for your yes vote on this article. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Planning Board? Mr. Lowry. Lowry. The Planning Board recommends favorable action. Any discussion on the motion before you? Mr. McLaughlin. This is for Brian. Get back up there. Hey, Brian, got a quick question for you. Uh, are the gas tanks, have they been removed, the underground tanks? No. They haven't. All right, so uh, what is the process of taking those out? They'll be removed, obviously, before a two-family dwelling goes and then, then you have to, is that site, would that be a clean site when they're removed? They've already done environmental. My client's They've done, already done it. Okay. He's done That's significant kind of environmental right. work on the property. Uh, do you have to go in front of the ZBA for any setback uh, um, issues or anything? No? Not that we see, Mr. McLaughlin. Okay, good to go. Thank you. Thank you. David Kelly, 48 Jordan Avenue. Uh, <clears throat> as Mr. McGrill said, this property's been in my wife's family for over 100 years. The house was built, I believe, in 1899. Uh, Mary's grandfather was a contractor. Uh, we ha actually have the original building permit from 1923. It's for a 12 by 12 filling station. Uh, over the years, it seemed to operate fine. Um, in more recent times, there's been overburden of use. Uh, I've had many complaints with the zoning board. Uh, actually, as Mr. McGrill said, uh, commencing litigation in the Superior Court. Uh, I'm here to tell you how happy I am for this motion, and I hope that you all can support it. Um, to trade an outdated gasoline station that no longer sells gasoline uh, and operates as an auto repair in a single family district for a two family I think is a win, 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 win. Uh, we couldn't be happier with that. Um, on days, I've counted as many as 30 cars on that lot. Uh, it, it, it's time has come and gone. It, uh, the neighborhood gas station no longer really works economically. Uh, and as Mr. McGrail had said, this lot is less than 12,000 square feet. So if the zoning um, change is, is, is um, enacted, it can only be a two-family. Uh, it it, there can be no more residences there than a two-family. Uh, so I, I ask for your support. Um, we fully support it. It's, it's um, a, a much better situation should, should uh, this be approved. Thank you. Thank you. Gerard Lehman, number 10, Fox Road. Uh, I also live in the neighborhood. I uh, just uh, approach to uh, echo everything that Attorney McGrail has said and all the benefits uh, that David Kelly uh, just mentioned. So happy to go on further if anyone has any questions about neighborhood perspective, but uh, I supremely hope you'll support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Discussion? Mr. Mitchell. Hi, Bob Mitchell. Uh, I'm going to vote no on this article. Uh, I've been to the gas station and I think it's uh, the, the right thing to do to replace it with a, a residence or, or some other commercial property, that's fine. But I think this is a vignette into a very big story that we've all seen in Wakefield and that's uh, too much density, overdevelopment, I mean, I've experienced that I've been here about, about 30 years. Uh, I can't speak for anyone else in this room, but I think a lot of people do feel it's just too much density, too much overdevelopment in this town, and this is just one more creep, a spot zone on one lot. This happens here. What happens to other single lots in your neighborhood 
or in other neighborhoods in the community. They're just going to get slowly being been diced up and rezoned by local attorneys and the few people who town government attend uh, town government town meetings. I think it's. I hope this uh, group can, group here can agree with me that it's just too much creep in the wrong direction. Uh, single family homes go for huge money and are. Anybody knows, you pick up the newspaper, they are highly desirable. Uh, granted, if you own the property, uh, you'll make a little more dough if you split it into two, no doubt about it. Uh, but I think this town has just gone overboard on overdevelopment, over density, uh, in all aspects of the town. It's just not, this happens not to be in my neighborhood, but I've seen it in my neighborhood. So I would hope you all think about how you feel about overdevelopment, density, and if you want to stand up tonight and say, yeah, let's have more density in Wakefield, that's what I want for the community, that's what I want for this beautiful New England town, then vote for it, but I am not, I'm voting this down. Thank you. Hi, um, John DeBose, 64 Airborne Ave. I will be voting yes on this article. Um, I do believe that um, Creating more density and multifamily units are very important in a town, in a growing community and growing area in Massachusetts. Um, also, a, it's a great solution to the climate crisis we are facing as young people in the town. We know that we cannot sustain single family housing any longer. We can't have um, single family housing um, helps um, the rich, people who can already afford homes, like people like me who most likely never be able to afford a home ever. We really need to be sure that as a town, we're moving forward, looking forward to the future and helping with multifamily units and making sure that we are a growing town open to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Hogan, 87 B. Gould, member of the planning board, but talking as a personal citizen in lieu of a member, speaking on behalf of the board. In terms of this zoning proposal, when it came in front of the planning board, what we heard from the, all the different members of the adjoining neighborhood was that they were in strong support of this proposal. It fit within the neighborhood character more than what is the current use at the site. And we found that it was a compelling argument to make it so a, a better land use than what would currently exist if we didn't make this change to the zoning. In addition, it was consistent with the zoning to the east and south of the parcel. And so for those reasons, the planning board voted unanimously to approve this. All the members of the community who talked at the planning board meeting voted in favor or indicated support. So I would ask that the members of this room do so in conjunction with what the owner of the parcel wants, what the community wanted, and what the planning board, board voted for. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy Cecia, 35 Yale Avenue. Uh, this article was described as being uh, to everybody's advantage. What is the advantage to the owner of the car repair company? Can you answer that briefly, Mr. McGrail? Can you sell the problem? If I can answer you, Mr. Moderator, just for clarification, does that mean the owner of the property or the owner of the business? The owner of the business. The business. Well, the owner of the business is a tenant to the property. He's a tenant. Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Any further discussion? Uh, this vote, the motion before you, that we approve the the town amend the zoning bylaws described in the article, requires a two-thirds vote, and I'm anticipating there may be a vote against this. So all the tellers will have to get up so we can get an accurate count. All in favor, please raise your hand and hold it in the air until you have been thoroughly counted. Thoroughly counted.
you get it? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Twenty six in the north. Forty six. You say forty six or twenty six? Twenty six. Oh, it's twenty six. Yeah. So wait, we, what's, what's the other one? What's okay? We got. Forty-seven in the middle. Forty-seven in the middle. All opposed. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I oh. have the rest of them. Yeah. There's one separate. There's another one. Wait. I've got twenty-six and forty-seven. And and sixteen. And 16. The first one was sixteen. Sixteen. Yeah, that's one. Well, I repeated it. I. All opposed. One in the north. Six in the middle. Two. Two. Okay, what's that come to? Eighty nine to nine. Motion carries. Article eighteen. Mr. New here? Yeah. Okay, come on up. Or come on down, as they say. Oh, we do. Okay. Mr. New, let me ask you a question. You yes. own land in town, correct? But you're not registered to vote. I, I didn't vote. Okay, so we'll entertain. Oh, it's not, no, are you registered to vote? To, in the state of Massachusetts? In, in Wakefield. Okay, all right. Okay, I'm just checking here. Um, so we'll entertain a motion to allow. Mr. New to speak Lou. on his, Lou, sorry. Okay, on his motion. Motion? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? All opposed? Mr. Lou, you're up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you so much. So, um, no, you have to read your motion now. Yes. Okay. The motion to repeal bylaw 190 318, set back from an open stream. In no case shall any building or structure be permitted within 50 feet of an embankment of okay. an open stream as defined by Conservation Commission using the applicable Massachusetts Department of Environmental Quality Engineering Standards. I highlighted embankment because it's kind of key to what part of my argument. Let me know when you're finished with your motion. Uh, motion is done. Okay. Sir. Mr. Mullen, you, you checked this, right? You've, it's, we're all, okay. Uh, is there a second? Second. All right, Mr. Liu, you yep. want to explain what your motion entails, okay? Yep. So my motion is to ask the town to consider repeal of this um, bylaw. Uh, I did go through, uh, go in front of the planning board, and the um, planning board was unanimously approved, uh, supported uh, repeal of, of this bylaw. Um, so this bylaw was, oops, sorry. This bylaw was implemented more than 31 years ago. Uh, application of this variance uh, to get a variance for this bylaw ha has only happened four times since 2019. Each time it went before the Zoning Board of Appeals, the ZBA based their decision based on a recommendation by Conservation Commission. Before 2019, this bylaw was unknown to Conservation Commission, and since 2019, enforcement has been inconsistent, meaning that certain property owners were asked to request a variance for this bylaw, and countless others were not. So the Conservation Commission is responsible for permitting wetland activities, not solely construction, up to 200 feet from streams and other wetland resources. The con commission utilizes data and science-driven regulations and performance standards outlined in the Wetlands Protection Act and Rivers Protection Act. This bylaw does not provide any additional protection beyond what is already determined by Conservation Commission in applying the Wetlands Protection Act. 
this bylaw is poorly worded and refers to an embankment. Embankments are steep man-made structures similar to you would find on both sides of a dike, uh, man-made reservoirs, uh, side of roads, mainly to keep flooding from happening. There are no embankments existing in Wake Wakefield near a naturally occurring stream anywhere. Conservation Commission has formally said that they will not provide any future determinations regarding this bylaw. So I ask you, how can it be enforced if there's a dependency on input from conservation? So homeowners seeking to build anything next to a stream are supposedly required to receive both a zoning variance and a wetland permit. In addition to the potential for added expense and time delays, an applicant could also face possibility of receiving contradictory decisions from two permitting boards. Repeal of this bylaw will aid homeowners by clarifying and streamlining the wetland permitting process as governed by the Conservation Commission. Thank you. Oh, Matt, Planning Board. The Planning Board recommends favorable action. Any discussion on the motion before you? Mr. Lieber. Thank you very, very much. Daniel Lieber, 1 Elm Street. I find it interesting that the rationale for, the proposed rationale for this particular article that's before us is on the complexity of our zoning bylaws. A few minutes ago, about an hour ago at this point, in Article 14, we approved uh, the expense of $50,000 for the recodification, the potential for expertise for recodification of our zoning bylaws. This seems like it would be an appropriate use and the appropriate time for this bylaw to be reviewed, as opposed to having this bylaw without having more extensive study on the townwide impacts of this bylaw be seen here at this time. So I'd recommend that we actually take it an in indefinite postponement on this particular article. I'm not going to make the motion at this time. Okay, I was going to say, yeah, don't, 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 yeah, don't, don't muddy the water. Jim Luciani, 20, 22 Wicker Lane. Um, also the chairman of the Conservation Commission, and we are in favor of removing this, uh, this bylaw. We don't think it functions very well. Good evening. Susan Palmer for 123 Greenwood Street. I am in all support of being responsible in how we deliver the um, fair development and safe development and respectful development of our town and its environment. And I think in removing this without having anything to replace it, we lose some safeguards. And although certainly language can be confusing, I think the spirit of what's written there is to be careful about building within 50 feet of a stream, whether we call it an embankment or not. And so I think further look at this and, and the language that's used is important instead of getting rid of this altogether, just for the sake of streamlining, instead of having a checks and balances. Thank you. Mr. Mitchell. Hi, uh, Bob Mitchell. Uh, I want to agree with what uh, Dan Lieber said earlier in that I think uh, there is an opportunity for some water protection rules to be reviewed by an upcoming committee. We, like you said, we just spent, spent $50,000 to do that. Uh, I am uh, probably no surprise to those who know you uh, absolutely totally opposed to anything that uh, encroaches on wetland. I mean, sort of unrelated, but we just spent five million bucks on a, on a water tower. It shows you how precious water is to us, but we're certainly not the only things that uh, live in the planet, and uh, climate change is a huge issue. I won't go into it, but 
every little thing you can do in your own community makes a difference to our community, but also shows other communities uh, that Wakefield isn't, uh, can I use the word, embarrassing on the way it handles uh, wetland issues. Uh, because in some circles, this town is embarrassing when it comes to environmental issues and how it protects wetland issues. Although that's, not, that's a bigger question, not related to the specific issue. Uh, I would just recommend everybody just pause and vote this down, at least for now. And uh, I think we should all be aware, because I'm certainly not aware of all the wetland properties in Wakefield that are but. Uh, the Saugus River, which is on both sides of Lake Quantipowit, uh, the Mill River, and there are many other uh, wetland areas in Wakefield that have already been, Lord knows how many have been filled over the years, the whole neighborhoods. The school we're on is, is uh, I think we had some problems with, a, didn't the prior, uh, I think the heating system in the prior Galvin got blown up because the Mill River that used to flow underneath there got put into a pipe and the pipe burst and it blew out the whole heating system to the Galvin a number of years ago, the older Galvin, because uh, this is uh, Cyrus Wakefield's old state. There used to be quite a large pond on it. So we filled in a tremendous amount. Uh, I'm not gonna lament that, but I just think it's, if you have any enlightenment on what's going on uh, locally or lands outside of Wakefield, I would urge you to support wetland resources whenever possible, especially in this instance, thank you. Okay. Jim Hogan, 87B Gould Street. Fundamentally, in my opinion, this, this proposal comes down to a poorly written regulation from the sometime in the 80s. We can't actually exactly pin down when. The embankment that's being referenced, where it's an open stream adjacent to a term that is not applicable for what it is from a technical level. The Conservation Commission is referenced as the body that would comment on the, the rules and regulations to what would or would not be applicable to this. They have commented that they are, are in favor of repealing this, that they will not comment on the technical standard as it relates to an embankment next to an open stream because that's from a technical level contradictory. In addition, this does not provide any additional protection for wetlands because every time that has been enforced and it's been enforced inconsistently that it, the ZBA basically completely defers to the Conservation Commission. So the protection of the wetlands, I think we all agree, is a very important aspect of the development process within town. However, the appropriate body for that is the Conservation Commission, not the Zoning Board of Appeals. They have the technical understanding of what is or is not appropriate, and this does not provide any additional protection because anything that is within, I believe it's 200 feet of any open body of water is protected under the jurisdiction of the CONCOM. I'd recommend that we consider repealing this and getting rid of a redundant extra layer to the process that doesn't provide any benefit to the town. Thank you. Any further discussion? There being no further discussion, the motion before you is that the town amend the zoning bylaws as described in the motion by Mr. Liu. Uh, this also requires two thirds. All in favor? All opposed? Uh, tellers, we're gonna need the tellers. Thank you. All in favor, raise your hand and hold it in the air until you're sure your vote has been counted. Twenty-four in the middle. All right. Huh? It'll go down. Seventeen. 
17. All opposed, raise your hand and make sure your, count, your vote is counted. Somebody's doing the math. Um, 50 to 39. 50 to 39, so that doesn't make it right. Yeah, okay. 50 to 39, you guys, back up down there. 50 to 39. Yeah, 60 was needed. Okay, motion doesn't carry. All right, I will entertain a motion to dissolve the town meeting. Mr. Moderator, I move to dissolve this town meeting with thanks to the town clerk, WCAT, and the citizens of Wakefield. Thank you. All second. Thank you. All in favor? As usual, WCAT, they put on a, they put on a fabulous show all the time. <laughs> a little plug here. We've got to start to think about getting them some money. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to watch it. You, won't be, you folks won't be starring on TV here. I'm pointing to you guys over here, okay? And I know none of you like attention in front of the camera at all. So, oh, Maureen, don't even look at me. Yeah, there you go. Well, yeah, I'm the only one on this show. That's right. Thank you. <laughs>